As we turn in our Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, last week we talked about uh, a living sacrifice. And Paul described the reasonableness, the logic of living sacrificially. And so this week we're going to talk about what that looks like. He describes a sacrificed life in the rest of the chapter. Actually in chapter 13 also. But we're going to cover the rest of chapter 12 here today. And so let's begin reading in verse 1 of Romans chapter 12. Therefore I exhort you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, alive, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this present world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is good and well-pleasing and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, not to think more highly of yourself than you ought to think, but to think with sober discernment, as God has distributed to each one of you a measure of faith. For just as in one body we have many members, and not all the members serve the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members who belong to one another. And we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If the gift is prophecy, that individual must use it in proportion to his faith. If it is service, he must serve. If it is teaching, he must teach. If it is exhortation, he must exhort. If it is contributing, he must do so with sincerity. If it is leadership, he must do so with diligence. If it is showing mercy, he must do so with cheerfulness. Love must be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another with mutual love, showing eagerness and honoring one another. Do not lag in zeal, being enthusiastic in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, endure in suffering, persist in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, pursue hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Consider what is good before all people. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. Do not avenge yourselves, dear friends, but give place to God's wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing this, you will be heaping burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Father, give us the mind of Christ, so that we may see the world through his eyes and understand his priorities and live out his purpose. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. As we consider chapter 12, we remember that last week we talked about Paul saying, please be reasonable. We talked about that word reasonable service is the word we get the word logic from. It is logical that we sacrifice ourselves daily in the service of Christ. And it's not a, a, a slave service, it's a service for hire. It's service that, ha that has been paid for. Christ has paid for our lives, and therefore, it is a waste, it is theft, to live them for ourselves. We owe it to Christ to sacrifice ourselves daily. It's to be a living service. It's a sacrifice of our body every single day. It is a, we wake up and we seek to do His will every single day with every one of our faculties. And it's because of His uh, mercies, the fact that He has withheld so much from us and He has provided so much we don't deserve, that we owe Him this service. Mm -hmm. And we're not to be conformed to this world. Remember we talked about uh, the schematics of the <coughs> world, the way the world wants us to live, but but we don't allow the pressures of the world to push us into that cookie-cutter life that everyone else is living. We are to be transformed. The new seed that the Spirit has planted in us is to 
to uh, tr change us from the inside out, just as that uh, uh, caterpillar puts off its old skin and becomes something entirely new. So we are to put off the old man, and we are to allow Christ to transform us from the inside out into what it is that he has destined us to be. So what does that look like? We're to do that, he says, in verse 2, by the uh, renewing of our mind, our intellect, our thinking capacity, our, uh, the filter through which we see all the world, our worldview. We have a new way of thinking. We have a new way of uh, viewing the world. Uh, in our flesh, our, our old mind, it, everything is, is uh, seen through how it affects me, right? Sometimes our worldview is, is filtered through the pain that we've experienced in the past or the, the anger that is built up or our selfishness, or our narcissism, or, or any of the, uh, everything about the world is all about me. But that's not how Christ viewed his life. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It wasn't something uh, that was wrong for him to have, but he didn't cling to that. He let that go. He laid aside his glory. He became, he took on the form of a servant. And being fashioned in the likeness of men, he sat, he gave himself uh, as a sacrifice obediently to us, obedient even to the death of the cross. Why? Because of his, because of the glory that was set before him. And what glory is that? The glory of being the redeemer of all those who trusted in him. He did it for us. He looked beyond his glory and saw what he could do with us. It was because of his love for us. He had a renewed, he had a, he had a mind that was not centered or focused on himself. And so he saw us. And we are to have that worldview. We are to have a Christ-centered worldview. Okay. What does that look like? Does it mean that we close off from the world, and we go live in a, a, a monastery somewhere, and we spend our days uh, contem in, in contemplation and prayer and, and never actually accomplish anything? Do we cut ourselves off from the world and live as though uh, we lived 200 years ago and, and not participate in any? No. He, Paul describes uh, the renewed mind here. He, in this chapter, he tells us what it looks like to live with the mind of Christ. And he begins by telling us that we need to think soberly in verse 3. Now that word sober, that word sober is a very interesting word. The root of that word in Greek is the same word that we get the word salvation from. The word sober-minded means to have a saved mind. Isn't that fascinating? It really brings to life what Paul says in the uh, in, when he's describing the, uh, the uh, armor of God, when he says, put on the helmet of salvation, doesn't it? Salvation guards our thinking. When we realize that our good works... Our righteousness is as filthy rags in the eyes of God. And that we are the, uh, we, 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 uh, we gain all of our value. All the righteousness that we have, all the good we do in the world, everything that we offer anyone else <laughs> is just God working through us. That he has, has rescued us from the miry pit. That we are his handiwork, it really gives us a new perspective on who we are, isn't it? And to have a saved mind means that we recognize that he is to increase and we are to decrease. That we are to lift him up. We are not self-exalting. We are not self-serving. We have a rescued mindset. He has saved more than our life. He has saved our eternal soul. And therefore, 
We can never repay that. Everything we have, everything we are, belongs to Him and is to be focused on Him. So when we begin to see the world not as self-righteous people who are better than our neighbors and, and you know, we're, we're so smart and talented and we have so much ability and kindness and, and I'm so humble that people just can't believe it. Um, that's not the way. That's not a saved mind. The saved mind is to say, I would be nothing if he had not rescued me, and therefore everything I am it belongs to him. What a new way to think, to have a sober mind. He says, don't think more highly of yourselves than you ought to think. And it's fascinating. The Greek word here is hyperthinking. <laughs> to hype yourself up. That's not the way we're supposed to think. We're supposed to, now, now we don't, put on false humility either. You know, oh, I'm nothing, I can't do anything, I have no, no, nothing to offer. No, we're to think of ourselves as we ought to think. How is that? It is that Christ has chosen us. We are the chosen of Christ. We are elect in Him. And we are His people here in this place. We are members of His body. How much value does that give us? How much uh, uh, authority and, and, and ability to, uh, to interact, to, to uh, impact those around us, does the Holy Spirit dwelling inside me give? We're not to be self-exalting or self-serving. We're to recognize that we are rescued people. However, we each have a purpose. But that purpose is a gift of God. He says, as God has distributed or given to each of you a measure of faith. In other words, uh, uh, an ability to act in him, to have, to, to have the trust of, uh, in him that he will do what he has prepared you for. Verse 4, for just as in one body we have many members, not all the members serve the same function. But they're all important, aren't they? You know, there are some members that we can live without, but it does. But but we're not complete without <coughs> them, are we? You know, it's pretty common to have you know a problem with your tooth, and you have it pulled, and and the first one's okay, and the second one, but finally you get like me, and you you have trouble getting two to meet, <laughs> and it makes makes uh, eating a steak a little more difficult, doesn't it? Am I living a happy life without, uh, without those missing teeth? Yes. Would I rather have them back? Yes. The body needs them. They're part of the body. They serve a purpose. Every part of the body serves a purpose. And, you know, God has called you into this body to serve a purpose. And if you choose to, to go elsewhere or, or give your life to something else, the body will continue but we'll miss you. God has called you in to the body. He has given you a place here. We have many members, and not all the members serve the same function, but all the members are important. We belong to one another. We all are part of the body of Christ, and we all share his DNA, right? And we all serve each other. The body functions best when every member is serving in his capacity or her capacity for the whole body. And so you may think you're not important, but I can tell you the Bible says you are vital. You are very important. And you have a purpose and a place here, not because of who you are, but because of who Christ is making you, who he is transforming you into, what it is that he has planned to do with you. We belong to one another. For just as in one body we have many members and not all the members serve the same body, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually we are members who belong to one another. Everyone has a purpose. Everyone has an ability. Everyone has a strength. Everyone has a measure of faith. And that is not so that you can be seen or you can be special or you can be exalted. That is so that you can serve your place 
in the body, so that I can serve my place in the body. He says in verse 6, we, and we have different gifts according to the grace given to us. We each have a different gift, but every gift is to be used for the body. And every gift is equally important. It is a grace. It is a gift. It is something that God has provided to you, not to use for yourself, but to use for others. That's what it means to live with a renewed mind, to recognize that you are special, that God has chosen you. He is working in you. You are his masterpiece, showing off his grace to those around you. But it's not for your glory. It's for the, for the edification, for the building up, for the, uh, for the work of the church, the body, the other believers. And then he goes through and he gives us a list list of gifts. This isn't an exhaustive list. This is just uh, probably what was on the top of his head. If the gift is prophecy, that individual must use it in proportion to his faith. If it is service, he must serve. If it is teaching, he must teach. If it is exhortation, he must exhort. If it is contributing, he must do so with sincerity. If it is leadership, he must do so with diligence. If it is showing mercy, he must do so with cheerfulness. If you have the ability to take God's word and to explain it and to preach it forth, the gift of prophecy, then you need to do so. You need to exercise the faith that God has given you. <coughs> if you don't have the gift of prophecy, but you have the gift of serving others, you can uh, help with the, the everyday work of the church, or you can go and take care of the needs of, of those in the church who are struggling, then do so. Serve. It is just as, in, the, the gift of service is just as important as the gift of prophecy. The gift of teaching, if you have the ability to explain concepts so that people can see them and understand them and actually put them into practice, then teach. If you have the uh, gift of encouraging others, building each other's up, exhorting one another, and we have uh, some in this church here who have that gift, and I am so thankful because at times when I have been struggling, uh, they've come along and, and exhorted me and built me up, and it's been such a blessing. It's important to do, and you may not think that's a gift. <laughs> it is. If your gift is contributing, if God has given you an abundance of, uh, or, or maybe not even abundance, if God has given you uh, uh, finances or, or, or goods to be able to, to share with the body, then do so with sincerity. Not like Ananias and Sapphira, who, did, who, who contributed, but they contributed in deception. Remember, they sold their plot of land, and they brought it to the church, and they said, this is every penny we got for the sale of the land. And Peter said, uh, why are you lying to the Holy Spirit? It was your property. You could have given whatever portion you wanted to, and it would have been a gift. Why are you doing this in deception? We don't do that. We contribute in sincerity. We give uh, not to be uh, looked upon, not, to, not so people can see what we give, we give because God has given it to us to give. That's the gift that God has given. You do so with sincerity. If it is leadership, he must do so with diligence. If God has given you the ability to be a good organizer and uh, to be, to be uh, someone who, who can encourage others to walk with Christ, if, if God has given you the, the gift to be able to see a, a future vision and, and express that to others, then be diligent about it. Don't, uh, you know, don't uh, neglect <coughs> your work that God has called you to. If uh, it is showing mercy, do so with cheerfulness. If God has given you the ability to share forgiveness with others and encourage others in their forgiveness, do so with cheerfulness. Be uh, be. Uh, Joyful about it. Build each other up. Pull those who are who may be in a uh, uh, in a depression or 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 struggling. Pull them towards the joy of 
Christ. Every ability, whatever your ability, God has given you to be used for the body. And we see these listed here. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 9. Love must be without hypocrisy. Isn't the most annoying thing in the world someone who tells you they love you, but they never have time for you? They tell you they love you, but they're always looking for what they can get from you? Isn't that the way the world loves? They don't love me, they love how I make them feel. They love what they get from me. That's the problem with worldly love. It is self-centered. <laughs> but the love of God, the agape love, is self-sacrificing. Love must be without hypocrisy. We must love one another in sincerity. We must pour ourselves into each other. And what does that look like? So he goes through and he gives us some descriptions. He says, we are to seek the good. He says, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. So we don't look for the bad parts of each other. We seek to see the good in each other. And we seek to pull that out of each other and encourage one another in good work. We are to be devoted to one another in mutual love. What does this mean? This means we should enjoy one another's company. Now that's easy with some and others. But the fact is that when we put aside ourselves and the things that we think are important and we'd rather be doing, and when we fully focus <coughs> our attention on the other person and we give them our time and our love, and we allow them to be who God has made them to be. That's a sacrifice a lot of times, isn't it? But that's a sacrifice that we are called to make. I mean, look at Jesus. Can you imagine that the night that he betrayed him, Jesus got down and washed Judas' feet? Knowing He'd already told everybody he's going to betray him. And he gave him his love, attention, and service. And we may not, you know, enjoy someone's company. We need to learn to. We need to put ourselves aside and devote ourselves to each other. We should enjoy each other's company. We need to encourage one another. <clears throat> he says, uh, in eagerness honoring one another, do not lag in zeal. Be enthusiastic in spirit. Serve the Lord. You know, when an opportunity of service comes up, we don't want to be the ones who find all the reasons not to do it. When an opportunity for evangelism or or uh, the, we have an opportunity to do something that the Lord is calling us to do. We don't want to be the ones who say, well, that costs too much money or it takes too much time. Or uh, No, we want to be the ones who are enthusiastic and, and seeking to encourage each other to serve the Lord in various ways. We don't want to be the wet blanket on the work of God. We want to be encouraging one another and praying for one another. Rejoicing in hope, enduring in suffering, persist in prayer. We encourage one another uh, by rejoicing even in the difficult times, by seeing that God has given us the hope of eternal life, the hope of the, uh, the victory of the church, the hope of serving Him forever, the hope of the resurrection. We rejoice in hope and we uh, encourage one another by enduring in suffering. By holding one another up, we weep with those who weep, we mourn with those who mourn, we, we uh, remind each other of the, the joy in Christ, and we pray for one another. We persist in prayer for each other. And we love one another by providing for one another. Contribute to the needs of the saints, pursue 
hospitality. We take care of each other. We share what God has given us. And we, we have each other uh, in our <coughs> homes, or if that's not possible, we'll meet together someplace else, and, and we just spend time together. And then we put up with one another. <laughs> now it's interesting. He says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. He's talking about other believers. Now do you remember what's going on in the church in Rome? We talked about this weeks and weeks ago in the introduction. Remember, uh, Caesar had expelled all the Jews from Rome, so the Jews who had founded the church in Rome had had to leave, and the Gentile believers were, were all that was left. And then decades later, Nero comes to the throne and allows the Jews to come back because the Jews have a lot of money, and he needs the money, and so he has them come back to Rome. And the Jewish Christians come back to the church and they find a fully Gentile church and they're all upset that they're eating pork and, and not following the law. And the Gentiles say, we don't need the law anymore. So they're fighting with each other and they start to give each other a hard time. That happens in churches everywhere. There's all, there are always going to be people that you don't agree with and they don't agree with you, and they're going to give you a hard time about something. I hope nobody here are the persecutors. I hope we're all on the, the, the being persecuted side. But even those people we need to bless. Even those people who say we don't do it right. Even those people who, who all they want to do is tell us how, how we're doing it wrong and, and try to push us out. We want to be the ones who bless them. We bless those people. We don't curse them. We don't call down God's judgment on them. We put up with one another. And we support with one another. Rejoice, as I said before in verse 15, with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. And then we respect one another. Live in harmony with one another. You know what harmony is? It's several different notes. They're different notes, but they sound good together. <laughs> they fit together. And we're all different notes on the page. But God has designed us to play chords, to be able to harmonize together. So if we're not jangling with each other, if we're not too sharp with one another, or if not flat on each other, if we're in tune with one another, we produce a harmony. And isn't that beautiful? God has designed us to live in harmony with one another. How do we do that? Well, we have to respect one another. He says, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not be conceited. Don't think that you're more important or you're better or you're nicer or you're more godly or you're too smart. No. We associate <laughs> with the lowly. No one is, is too... Uh, no, I'm, not I'm not too important to get along with anyone. I'm not, I need to, to not be conceited but to associate with, with from the smallest child everyone that God brings to us. And now, he, he's, he changes focus. The sacrifice life is a life of living, of loving for real, those who are within the body. <clears throat> but the sacrifice life is also loving for real, those who are <clears throat> outside. <clears throat> the body. He tells us to love our enemies. Verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. We don't seek revenge within the body or even those who are outside the body. When the world when unbelievers do evil things to us, we don't do evil things back. 
No. We consider what is good before all people. How can I show God's grace, God's love, God's goodness to those who hate me? If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all people. Now there are some people who are just not going to be at peace with you. And that's out of your hands. As long as you are doing everything you can to live at peace with everyone you can, then the others God will take care of. Because he says, do not avenge yourselves, dear friends, but give place to God's wrath. In other words, step out of the way and let God's wrath have its course. If you take revenge, that's not going to be anything like what God is going to do. Nor is it going to be effect, as effective as God's vengeance. If you're standing in the way of God's <clears> vengeance, <throat> things are not going to be pleasant for you. <laughs> we need to give place to God's wrath. You just keep loving people and you let God take care of them. You let God handle it. Why? Because he says... In Deuteronomy, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Now, say someone does horrible things to you, and they get away with it. And they go on to live a successful life, and they seem happy, and, and it looks like everything's great, and they live a hundred years of pleasure and prosperity, and then they die. And they spend eternity. Do you think that whatever they did to you was bad enough to equal an eternity in hell? Do you think whatever vengeance you could have taken will be equal to what God is going to take? Vengeance is mine. I will repay. Nobody gets away with it. Nobody gets away from it. God will take his vengeance. We may not see it, but it is real, says the Lord. Rather, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing this, you will be heaping burning coals on his head. We need to seek to turn our enemies into friends. We serve them. What did Christ do on the cross? Do you remember? These people had humiliated him. They rejected him. Humiliated him. Beaten him. Crucified him. <clears throat> mocked him after he was crucified while he was in the process of dying. And what does he say? Father, forgive them. He calls for mercy for those who hated him. What did the centurion at the foot of the cross say? Surely this was the Son of God. We care for those who hate us. Why? Because Christ cares for them. And we heap burning coals on their head. We're trying to ignite their conscience. Get them hot enough, and maybe their conscience will spark, and will call them to repentance. Do not be <clears throat> overcome by evil. That's what happens when we decide to take vengeance for ourselves. That's what happens when we live with the old worldview, the selfish worldview, that everything focuses on me. We may have the best of intentions and we may love the Lord and we may seek, uh, we may desire to please Him. But the fact is that doing so through our own intelligence, by our own direction, with our own priorities, is going to overcome us in uselessness. But we can overcome evil with good if we have the good inside us, transforming us out. How do we live a sacrifice? 
a sacrificed life. We live so by having the mind of Christ. Father, we are so thankful that Christ did not choose to just wipe us out and start over or to just allow us to go to hell and reap the consequences of our choices. The Father, that Christ laid aside his own glory and chose to humiliate himself in order to exalt us. And Lord, it is our reasonable service to lay aside our priorities and plans and desires and to seek his mind. Give us the mind of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.